Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the first thing I've got to ask you to do is pardon my coughing. It appears that I have a bad cold, and um, I'm trying to figure out what to do about it, so uh, please pardon me. Uh, we are here really today to talk about a number one problem in the United States, and it is the problem of prescription drug abuse. Um, the Vice Chairman, uh, Senator Grassley, and I have worked closely through a series of reports on other countries and a report on prevention in this country, but we haven't really touched this issue, and it's a growing issue, and I think one that needs some congressional attention. Prescription drug abuse has been identified as the fastest growing drug problem in the country. According to a recent monitoring, a monitoring the future survey, prescription drugs like Vicodin, Oxycontin, Opana, and Methadone are the second most abused category of drugs after marijuana. Unfortunately, prescription drug abuse is often fatal. According to the Centers for Disease Control, the number of unintentional overdose deaths per year involving opiate pain relievers such as oxycodone and hydrocodone increased by 438% over 10 years from 1999 to 2009, rising from 2,900 to 15,597. That is a whopping increase. Overdose deaths from these drugs in 2007 were twice those from cocaine and over five times those from heroin. Nearly all prescription drugs involved in overdoses are originally prescribed by a physician. Now that's interesting. So over half have a pr prescription rather than being stolen from pharmacies. This tells us that we must target our efforts to control medications at doctor's offices by preventing the diversion of prescription drugs after they're dispersed. In April of 2011, the Obama administration responded to the rising rate of prescription drug abuse through the Office of National Drug Control's policy prescription drug abuse prevention plan. There are two immediate actions from the administration's plan that I would like to share with you. First, education must be provided to healthcare providers of prescription drugs on addiction and how to recognize diversion tactics. This is really a no-brainer. Um, I'm going to skip parts of this in the interest to get to the testimony. Last week, the Food and Drug Administration began this effort by approving a program to educate physicians about proper pain management. As part of this plan, the FDA will require some opiate drug manufacturers to make available training on proper prescribing practices. Very important. How often should a doctor be required to prescribe the drug? How often should the doctor be required to see the patient before re-prescribing the drug. This, I think, is a step in the right direction, but it doesn't cover all abused painkillers. It doesn't reach all healthcare providers, and it isn't mandatory. Over a four-year period, it is estimated that this training will reach approximately 60% of the 320,000 providers authorized to prescribe controlled substances. So train as many people as you can. Hopefully, medical boards across the country will include this type of training in their curriculum and continuing education requirements. Secondly, while 49 states have legislation authorizing electronic prescription monitoring systems, these systems are new, and in many states, they're not yet operational. In others, such as California, they have not been upgraded to properly function without crashing, which makes prescribers less in, in, inclined to use them. In addition, not enough physicians and pharmacists are trained and registered to use the systems. More providers need to use them to stop people from using multiple physicians to obtain multiple prescriptions. 
Ideally, a state's electronic systems would be interoperable, one with the other. And there also must be coordination between federal agencies, such as the Veterans Affairs Department, Defense Department, hospitals, mainstream healthcare systems. Finally, illegitimate pharmacy websites need to stop selling drugs to consumers who have not been evaluated by a medical professional. A bill that I have authored, the Online Pharmacy Safety Act, would target these rogue online drug sellers in two ways. First, it would require that at least one person, excuse me, one in-person medical evaluation be conducted in most instances before prescriptions could be used. How could anybody object to that? Before you prescribe an opiate in an amount, you at least should see the individual. And second, the bill would direct the FDI to create a registry of legitimate online pharmacy websites to give consumers the information they need to make good decisions when purchasing prescription drugs online. So, I thank the witnesses for coming today to testify, especially uh, the parents, uh, Mr. Israel and Mr. Porter, who came to share with us their very difficult personal stories. And now I'd like to turn to my co-chairman, Senator Grassley, and then introduce the distinguished first panel that we have. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, you covered about three issues I was going to cover, so I'm going to skip those and go to uh, uh, just the main points and then put my entire statement in the record. Uh, of course, one reason that these uh, medications are easy to obtain is, <coughs> is the obvious because uh, many people have the view that since the drug is obtained by a doctor's prescription, the drug has to be safe for anyone uh, to use. Uh, you talked about the rise of prescription drug abuse in pharmacy and the problems that it creates uh, not only for the uh, society as a whole, but it has created a major problem for pharmacists themselves, and I'm glad that we have uh, doc Dr. Joseph Harmison here to go through that with us. You touched on the issue of the state uh, uh, monitoring programs. I, I have an example from my own state of Iowa. According to the data captured by uh, the Gateway Impact Community Coalition, this is an anti-drug coalition headquartered in Clinton, Iowa, some health care uh, practitioners are not using this Iowa system that you referred to that other states have to its full potential. Uh, Iowa's uh, prescription monitoring program has been operational for three years. However, according to a survey conducted by this Clinton County, Iowa Gateway <coughs> Coalition, 85% uh, uh, of the prescribers report prescription drug abuse is a problem in the community, yet only 52% of the prescribers actually use the monitoring system. The same survey also shows that nearly half of the prescribers in the county are not aware of any effort to address prescription drug abuse. Because of this survey, the Gateway Impact Coalition has identified an area where they can have a direct impact in the fight against prescription drug abuse through increased education of practitioners. Iowans have also been impacted <coughs> by uh, an <coughs> inability to obtain medicine that is properly prescribed to them due to a series of, uh, of prescription drug shortages. And I refer here to a GAO study and uh, action that I've taken with Senator Whitehouse uh, in regard to this, and I'll put the rest of the statement in the record. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, I'd now like to welcome our first panel of witnesses. First is my friend and colleague from California, Congresswoman uh, Bono Mack. She represents California's 45th Congressional District, which encompasses much of Riverside County, including that great destination of Palm Springs. She currently serves on the House Energy and Commerce Committee, is chairwoman of the Subcommittee on Commerce, Manufacturing, and Trade. And most importantly for today's hearing, 
She is a co-founder of the Congressional Caucus on Prescription Drug Abuse. She is someone who cares, and uh, what I would like to do is ask everybody to confine their remarks to five minutes because we have two panels, and we will begin with the Congresswoman, and then I will introduce Mr. Karakowski and Mr. Ranazisi. Thank you very much, uh, Senator. It's a pleasure to be here with you and to see you, and always a great pleasure to have you in my district. Um, hurry back. We love having you there. Thank you. It's great to be here with you as well, Co-Chairman uh, Co Grassley. I'd like to thank you both for this opportunity to testify before the Senate Caucus on International Narcotics Control. We have a deep shared commitment when it comes to combating prescription drug abuse. As Chairman of, of the House Subcommittee on Commerce, Manufacturing, and Trade, I've had several hearings on this deadly public health epidemic. And one undeniable fact stands out. The problem of pres prescription drug abuse is getting worse, and a comprehensive national strategy for combating it is desperately needed. As Americans, we rightly rally around efforts to, to fight breast cancer, childhood diseases, and other serious health threats. But for far too long, there have only been hushed whispers about prescription drug abuse, now the fastest growing drug problem in America, and that's according to the CDC. So as the death toll from, from uh, prescription drug overdoses continues to rise sharply, it's time to move this story from the obituary page to the front page where it belongs. It's time to realize that we can't simply wish this horrific problem away, not with more than 20,000 people a year dying from it, not when the number of babies born addicted to the class of drugs that includes prescription painkillers has tripled in the past decade, not when nearly one out of four high school seniors has used prescription painkillers. This is nothing less than a national tragedy. If 20,000 people died each year from food poisoning, Americans would demand immediate attention. So why has it taken so long for our governmental agencies to get serious about combating prescription drug abuse? Why did the Food and Drug Administration, for example, spend nearly three years before deciding this month that drug companies which make, quote, extended release or long-acting painkillers, end quote, uh, must provide expanded education to prescribers and consumers about the dangers and risks of addiction. How many people have died needlessly in the meantime? Instead of three years, it should have taken the FDA about three minutes to take action after looking at the skyrocketing statistics and horror stories all across America. So what's the answer? I believe one critically important first step is to, to do a better job of monitoring and limiting access to prescription drugs containing controlled release oxycodone hydrochloride, including the popular uh, painkiller OxyContin. Originally, OxyContin was intended to be prescribed only for severe pain as a way to help patients dealing with late stage cancer and other severe illnesses. Today, however, more and more people across America are being prescribed OxyContin as well as other generic oxycodone drugs for less severe reasons, clinically known as moderate pain, greatly expanding the availability and potential for abuse of these powerfully addictive narcotics. Consider this, the DEA has conducted four national drug take back days over the past year and a half, and they've collected an astonishing 1.5 million pounds of unused and unneeded medicines. That's 1.5 million pounds, not pills, in just four days. Compounding the problem is an oftentimes false sense of security. If it's approved by the FDA and prescribed by a doctor, then it must be okay. But too many pills taken at once or combining them with other drugs and alcohol can have serious and oftentimes deadly consequences. Today, the black market sale of powerful and highly addictive narcotic painkillers like OxyContin and Vicodin is big business, prompting the DEA to, be, uh, to attack the problem on multiple fronts, from street level sales all the way to the top of the supply chain. But there is another, more insidious side of the story as well. After becoming addicted to prescription painkillers, law enforcement authorities say more and more people are switching to heroin. In San Diego County, which borders my district, drug treatment experts say that the use of heroin by young adults has more than tripled since 2006. Much of this growth is due to people who have switched to heroin as a cheaper alternative to OxyContin. Personally, I will never forget the chilling phone call I received one night from a Palm Springs constituent who told me that his son had had a gun pointed at his head because he could not pay the street price of Oxy. While we're starting to see some progress in the fight against prescription drug abuse, a lot more clearly has to be done. 
by better coordinating the efforts of local, state, and national agencies, and by reducing the supply of highly addictive opioid painkillers, I am convinced that we can eventually save thousands of lives and spare millions of American families from the devastating heartache of addiction. Thank you again, Chairman Feinstein, and members of the, caucus, excuse me, of the caucus for your personal commitment to this critically important issue. I hope you'll join me in setting up a stakeholder meeting where we can bring everybody together to talk about solutions to this growing epidemic. Again, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think that's a very good idea. And as I said to you personally, if you need to leave, please do so. Uh, if you'd like to remain, we'd be delighted. And you can certainly, if there isn't a chair because we've got a packed house, come up here. If you'd like to sit on the Democratic side, <laughs> I'd love that. Yeah, maybe I appreciate I'll only make it available on the Democratic <laughs> side. I appreciate no, that I, very please. much. And I, I do hope to stay around and support the, the second panel, and perhaps I'll join you up there. So thank you again. Very thank much. you very much. Um, next, we have the director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. He is Gil Kirilikowski. Uh He is the administration's top counter-narcotics official, coordinating all aspects of federal drug control programs and implementation of the President's National Drug Strategy. In April of last year, his office authored the National Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention Plan, which included a number of action items that we're going to discuss today. Mr. Kurlikowski brings 37 years of law enforcement and drug policy experience to the position. Prior to this position, he served for nine years as the chief of police in Seattle, Washington. When he last left Seattle, crime was at its lowest point in 40 years. As a former mayor, that really means something to me. So welcome, and we're delighted to hear from you, Gil. Good. Thank you, Chairman Feinstein and uh, Co-Chairman Grassley. It's a great pleasure to be here in front of you, and I have this opportunity to update you and the caucus on the issue of prescription drug abuse. And since I've been in office, uh, this has been a signature effort uh, for us. It is um, uh, my thanks, my personal thanks to the Congresswoman uh, for really bringing this uh, to my attention in the very first week that I was in office. Because frankly, like a lot of Americans, I really was not aware of the devastation and the level of the prescription drug abuse problem. And I'm indebted to her. Prescription drug abuse has been characterized as a public health epidemic by the CDC and the scope of non-medical use of pharmaceuticals is striking. And you mentioned that in your opening statement, uh, uh, Chairman, uh, so <coughs> I won't go into some of those numbers. But in April, we did release the administration's prescription drug abuse prevention plan. And it focuses on four pillars, and that's what I'd like to update you on. They're all designed to intervene at a critical juncture in the process of prescription drug diversion and abuse, and we have made progress in each one of those <coughs> areas, although certainly much more needs to be done. And the first pillar is education. Prescription painkillers are prescribed by primary care doctors, internists, and dentists. Last week, I joined FDA Commissioner Hamburg to uh, an announce the FDA's risk evaluation and mitigation strategy for those extended release and long-acting opioids, which requires manufacturers to develop educational materials and training for prescribers. The administration is working with our agency partners to amend federal law to require mandatory education <coughs> training for the prescribers. And we're also working to educate the general public about the risks and prevalence of prescription drug abuse and the fact that uh, young people don't recognize, or many people, as uh, the vice chair said, uh, don't recognize the dangers of those drugs. Our national youth anti-drug media campaign has developed materials to educate youth about the dangers of prescription drug abuse, and it's one of the most important national tools for educating them and their parents about the dangers of prescription drugs. And through the Drug-Free Communities Program that we support in over 700 community coalitions that work with local youth, parents, business, religious, and other civic leaders to disseminate information. On the second pillar, monitoring, we focused on expanding and improving the state prescription drug monitoring programs. Today, I'm pleased to say that 49 states now have PDMPs, yet some of them lack operational programs. Many states that operate the PDMPs lack interoperability. 
And although 11 states now have the ability to share information with each other, we know this has to be expanded. And as you mentioned, the administration worked with Congress and the Department of Veterans Affairs so that they can also participate uh, in this important program. The third pillar of our plan focuses on the safe disposal of unused expired med medications. Through those four coordinated national prescription drug take back days, DEA with their local law enforcement partners have collected over 750 tons of medications. And the next take back day is scheduled for September 29th during Medication Abuse Awareness Week. And completion of DEA's rulemaking process will make safe disposal of prescription drugs more convenient. We also recognize the issue of pill mills and DEA along with the United States attorneys and prosecutors at the state and local level uh, have really taken on this issue and I think Florida is becoming a real success story when it comes to shutting these down. And we recognize the important role that medication can also play in naloxone in reversing the drug overdoses, a life-saving uh, treatment that we want to see expanded and as we work uh, to see that done, uh, more lives can be saved as a result of the overdose issues. And we're working uh, on the clinical and policy issues on the neonatal abstinence syndrome. That is the withdrawal syndrome uh, symptoms exhibited by infants born to opioid-dependent mothers. And in August, we'll be convening a meeting uh, uh, at the White House Conference Center with stakeholders about this. Finally, this last year, after we released the plan, the administration participated in the National Prescription Drug Abuse Summit in Orlando. Over 700 people attended from local, state, and national leaders and members of Congress and affected family members. And we know that this was an important first step in also taking this issue on and bringing it to more people's attention. In closing, I'd like to recognize that none of these things that my office, ONDCP, and my executive branch colleagues want to accomplish, none of that would be possible uh, without the ongoing support of Congress. And thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very much, Mr. Karolikowski. Uh, Joseph Ranazisi is the Deputy Assistant Director of the Office of Diversion Control at the Drug Enforcement Administration, known as the DEA. As Deputy Assistant Administrator, Mr. Ranazisi is responsible for overseeing and coordinating the investigation of major pharmaceuticals, forerunner chemicals, clandestine laboratories, and synthetic drugs. In addition, he's responsible for establishing drug production quotas. Mr. Ranazisi also serves as a liaison to the pharmaceutical industry. He was appointed as deputy administrator in January of 06 and has served with the DEA for over 25 years. Welcome, Mr. Ranazisi. Thank you for testifying. Good afternoon, Chairman Feinstein, Co-Chairman Grassley, distinguished members of the caucus. On behalf of Administrator Michelle Linhart and the men and women of the Drug Enforcement Administration, Thank you for the opportunity to appear today to discuss prescription drug diversion and abuse and DEA's role in maintaining the integrity of the controlled substance delivery system. The diversion and abuse of pharmaceuticals continues to be a significant threat in the United States, crossing all age, gender, racial, and socioeconomic boundaries. The ease of availability of prescription medication to non-medical users due to diversion within the medication delivery system is one of the reasons it continues to exist. Consistent with the administration's 2011 Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention Plan, DEA is addressing this problem by focusing resources on initiatives on multiple fronts, including secure medication disposal, education, and enforcement. The collection and disposal of pharmaceuticals is a key pillar in the plan. Dispensed pharmaceuticals remain in household medicine cabinets well after medic medication therapy is completed, thus providing easy and sometimes free access to non-medical users, which poses a greater risk of accidental ingestion poisoning by, our chil by children and the elderly. DEA, in coordination with our state, local, and tribal law enforcement partners, governmental agencies, and private groups, has organized four nationwide take-back events in September 2010. And those resulted in uh, the disposal of more than 775 tons of unwanted expired medication. In October 2010, Congress passed and the President signed the Secure and Responsible Drug Disposal Act. DEA is working diligently to promulgate regulations that will allow public to dispose of their unwanted and expired controlled substance medications securely 
and responsibly. In the interim, DEA will continue to coordinate the National Take Back Initiative until disposal regulations are in place. The next Take Back event will be on September 29, 2012. DEA also continues to educate registrants and healthcare professionals concerning their legal obligations under the CSA. DEA's distributor initiative began in 2005 to educate the higher levels of the distribution chain, and it continues today. DEA, in cooperation with the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy, began a new educational initiative specifically for pharmacists in September of 2011. The conference provides pharmacists with information regarding abuse and diversion trends, proper dispensing procedures, and prescription drug monitoring programs. To date, we have educated more than 1,600 pharmacists in Florida, Ohio, Indiana, and Georgia. Two more pharmacist conferences are scheduled later this fiscal year in <coughs> New York. DEA personnel at headquarters and field level also provide awareness training to professional organizations, societies, and community groups throughout the country. DEA registrants throughout all levels of the healthcare delivery system must play a role in identifying and preventing drug diversion. Unfortunately, when any level of distribution chain fails, opportunities for controlled substance diversion will occur. Therefore, it's vital that the registrants and their employees understand their obligations under the CSE to ensure the system cannot be exploited for the purpose of diversion. DEA has increased registrant oversight by deploying stepped-up regulatory measures. This is a proactive measure to identify weaknesses in the supply chain before they can be exploited for diversion. When pharmaceutical drug diversion is identified, DEA diversion investigators and special agents are there to investigate it at all levels of the distribution chain. DEA's criminal investigations and stepped-up regulatory oversight are causing registrants to closely review their operations to ensure that they're compliant with the, DEA, with the CSA. When necessary, DEA will revoke the registration of a company or individual who fails to maintain compliance with the CSA or take civil or criminal action when warranted. Today, rogue pain clinics are the epicenter for illegal diversion operations and are responsible for illegal distribution to drug seekers and drug dealers. Every link of the distribution chain is complicit in this scheme, distributors, pharmacies, and practitioners. Distributors send massive quantities of drugs to pharmacies under suspicious circumstances. Pharmacies dispense drugs on the basis of illegitimate prescriptions, and unscrupulous practitioners issue legitimate prescriptions while failing to establish a legitimate medical need for the drugs. The driving force is huge profits. This method of diversion is no longer limited to Florida. Rogue clinics are now moving northward and are operating in Georgia, Tennessee, Kentucky, Ohio, and Missouri. Despite the proliferation of these clinics, DEA's education and enforcement efforts are paying dividends with their de deterrent effect. Manufacturers now notify their wholesale distributor customers that their lack of customer monitoring will result in discontinuation of business. Distributors are carefully monitoring customer orders, stopping sales when appropriate, and reporting suspicious orders to DEA. Pharmacists, as the medication experts in the healthcare delivery system, are exercising their professional judgment and more closely scrutinizing prescriptions. Combating prescription drug diversion is a top priority at DEA. DEA will continue to maintain the integrity of the closed system of distribution, thereby preventing the availability of pharmaceutical controlled substances to non-medical users. I'd like to thank Representative Bono Mack and Director Kurlikowski, who've taken a leadership role in getting the word out for this serious problem. Uh, without their help, uh, we'd be in a lot worse shape. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are now joined by the distinguished senator from New Mexico, Tom Udall, and um, Senator Udall, if you'd like to make a brief statement, then we will question the witnesses okay. together. Thank you, uh, Chairman uh, Feinstein and, and uh, Ranking Member Grassley, and thank you for letting me just make a brief opening statement. This, this impacts my state a lot, and I, I, uh, it's such an important issue, and it's hitting home uh, very hard. New Mexico has the sad distinction of having the highest rate of drug overdose deaths in the country. It's tragic and it's unacceptable. The nation's drug epidemic has moved from the streets to our medicine cabinets, from illicit drugs to prescription drugs, but the, but the outcome is the same. Destroyed lives, unnecessary deaths, and it reaches every racial, geographical, and social economic group. Since 2007, more New Mexicans have overdosed and died from prescription drugs like oxycodone, morphine, and methadone than from illicit drugs like heroin and cocaine. In the last decade alone, we've seen the overdose rate from prescriptions increase by over 60 percent. Pills are easy to get hold of, far too easily, especially for young people. Law enforcement has identified diverted prescription drugs that fall into the wrong hands as the most significant emerging drug threat statewide. 
They've also learned that prescription drug abuse is a gateway to heroin use. New Mexico teenagers and young adults are taking prescriptions to get high, but pills are expensive. Once they're addicted, they're resorting to heroin for two reasons. It's cheaper and easier to get, a lethal combination, and tragically, they are dying from it. This issue hits close to home for many of us. One of my own staff members who was raised in Albuquerque shared his story with me this week as we were preparing for this hearing. He's seen the problem firsthand. Over the, la the last three months, four people he went to Cibola High School with have died from heroin overdoses. Four deaths in three months. One was his best friend of 20 years, Michael. He was 30 years old. All four turned to heroin after abusing prescription drugs. Like many, Michael had sought treatment with the support of his family. He completed a 90-day private rehabilitation program. He was trying to stay clean. So you can see this is a great challenge we're facing in New Mexico, the State Pharmacy Board, physicians, epidemiologists, all are working hard to confront this growing problem, working to increase public health and education. And this discussion we're having here and the testimony we're hearing, I think, will go a long way to try to see where we come out in terms of solutions. And thank you, uh, Chairman Feinstein, for this and, uh, and Ranking Member Grassley. Appreciate the opportunity well, to give a statement. Look forward to questioning the witnesses. Well, thank you very much for being here. Uh, and as I said in my opening remarks, I think this is going to become, if it not already, the major drug problem in our country. And it's a very difficult situation because you have the pharmaceuticals that you have to go up against to get controls. And that's a big problem. Um, uh, Mr. Ranazizi, I was just reading your statement on page seven of your written remarks. You say further investigation, this is Florida, of pharmacy applicants revealed straw purchases of pharmacies that had ties to established rogue pain clinics. And then you go on and you talk about what you have done and that you have thus far obtained withdrawal of applications from 109 retail pharmacies and one distributor and then you talk about the majority being in South Florida. As a result of this, in Florida, 147 existing retail pharmacies have surrendered their registrations, again, the majority in South, preventing these pharmacies from conducting business, undoubtedly prevented millions of dosage units of controlled substances from entering the illicit market and closed an avenue of distribution and source of income for the rogue pain clinics. This initiative is ongoing. Um, I trust, and I've read something else about it here, um, that there's been a dramatic decline in the number of Florida doctors dispensing the most oxycodone within a given year. And in 2010, 98 of the top 100 dispensing physicians of oxycodone resided in Florida, but as of February 2012, only 13 of the top 100 now reside. So where did they go? No, that's not really my question. Um, why was this program so successful, and what resulted in this dramatic decline I just cited? Well, to start, uh, there was increased uh, enforcement pressure at the state and local level. Uh, our combined resources went after the rogue clinics fairly quickly and uh, very intense uh, enforcement. But the state helped themselves. The state passed a law that prohibited, actually two laws, the second law prohibiting them from dispensing controlled substances from the rogue pain clinics. Once that state law was in effect, these clinics, these rogue clinics, and they are rogue clinics, there's real clinics that actually perform medical therapy, and then there's rogue pain clinics. The rogue pain clinics made so much money that could go out and actually start buying pharmacies. Explain how the rogue pain clinic functions. Well, a, a rogue pain clinic <coughs> is a clinic that is using um, therapy as a facade for actually drug trafficking. What they're doing is trafficking in opiates and benzodiazepines and 
muscle relaxants. Uh, when you go into the clinic, you have minimal uh, interaction with the doctor. Uh, he may look at some diagnostic tests. If you don't have them, he may send you someplace to get them, but in either case, he's going to give you your medication. He's going to charge you uh, quite a bit for that uh, visit, and uh, generally it's in cash. Uh, it's not medical intervention. It's, it's drug trafficking. Well, these clinics are making so much money that they started buying pharmacies, using straw purchasers like uh, people who work in, in the lawn care business, bartenders, uh, secretaries. And in Florida, that's the only state where we actually go out and do inspections and do evaluations. Generally, that's in the purview of the, the Board of Pharmacy. The Board of Pharmacy does those inspections and determines whether they could be licensed or not. But in Florida, we had such an influx of applications when we looked at them and we started doing checking. Uh, it was just the clinic owners that were going out and buying the pharmacies because they couldn't dispense that medication and they were making a lot of money dispensing medication out of those rogue clinics. So that's why we initiated and it is working. It's, they're not getting the pharmacies up and operational to support and facilitate their drug trafficking and what we're seeing is they're moving out of Florida and into other states. And you're absolutely right when you said where did they go? They moved to other states. Uh, do you know which states they've moved to? Georgia, Tennessee, Kentucky, Ohio, uh, out to Missouri. There's some in California. There's some in Texas. Uh, but this, the, the states, like, for instance, Georgia, we're working very closely with the Georgia Bureau of Investigation and the Georgia Bureau of Narcotics. Uh, they're seeing an influx in these pain clinic owners coming up into their state and opening shop, and they're seeing the same thing that Florida saw two and three years ago. Do you see, uh, can you make any correlation between the death record and these pain clinics? Uh, the Florida medical examiner uh, has done a really good job of showing uh, the drug deaths over the last few years and the type of drugs that were involved in those deaths. And yes, I think you could show a correlation as the number of clinics within Florida grew and increased, the number of deaths related to oxycodone and alprazolam and methadone and morphine increased as well. It's really a sad situation. Well, welcome in California. That will get me in trouble in certain sectors, but don't let it, it doesn't worry me. But, uh, you know, I knew a youngster that did overdose on oxycodone, and uh, this, is, this has got to stop, and we've got to find a way to do it. Uh, Senator Grassley. Uh, my first uh, uh, statement is directed at DEA, and you probably can't answer this because you weren't here the last time we had DEA here. But you remember uh, Senator Feinstein had a constituent that was jailed without anybody concerned about him uh, for four or five days. So I wrote a letter as ranking member of the Judiciary Committee to DEA, and uh, I got a non-response. So the last time we had a meeting here with DEA, I asked the person that testified at that time if he'd get me an answer, and I still don't have an answer. So I hope that uh, you could get that letter answered. Sir, I'll take that back yeah. to the department. Yeah. Well, I and hope in your position at the top of the, just about at the top, that you can get me an answer. Uh, otherwise, it's kind of like saying, shove it up your nose, you know. I wouldn't say that, sir. My <laughs> wouldn't <laughs> say uh, Director Kurlikowski, uh, how involved, uh, I just have one question for you. How involved was uh, ONDC, ONDCP? in the development of the Food and Drug Administration's risk evaluation and mitigation strategy for prescription drugs that was just released. We were involved in collaborating with them and talking with them and, uh, and them taking this issue on. Of course, as, as you know, Senator, they have their own process. Uh, this is a good step in the right direction, <coughs> a good first step, uh, but more will need to be done. Yeah. Uh, for you, Mr. Ranazizi, uh, in regard to uh, hydro codone and uh, biocodone. Uh, could you please explain why DEA supports the reclassification of hydrocodone and why the FDA has been resistant uh, over the years to this effort? Well, DEA has sent, uh, 
has sent a medical, and evalu a medical evaluation request and scientific evaluation request up to FDA. Uh, in 2008, we received a, uh, a response basically saying that they don't believe it should be removed from Schedule 3 into Schedule 2. We've subsequently sent a new medical and scientific re evaluation request back in 2009, and we're waiting for a response. Okay. Are you concerned about the impact of the classification of this drug may have on access of legitimate users or the supply of this drug in general? Uh, absolutely. The, the, uh, as a Schedule 3, uh, besides the fact that you have multiple refills, up to five refills, uh, we're seeing this drug basically overprescribed. If anybody who's been to the dentist lately, and I don't want to pick on the dentist, but anybody who's been to the dentist for any kind of dental treatment, generally the, the dentists are prescribing 20, 30, 40 tablets of Vicodin uh, to treat dental pain. Now, generally you only take one or two tablets, if anything, and where does it go into the medicine cabinet? Where is the medicine cabinet in the home where the kids are? And if you go to any high school and you ask about Vicodin, they're going to tell you what they know about it. And that's a problem. It's a problem to me. And I'm sure it's a problem to a lot of other healthcare professionals as well. Uh, what could the potential cost be in reclassified uh, hydrocodone? Uh, and how many compound drugs would be affected if that was changed? I haven't done a cost analysis, but I don't understand how there could be a cost analysis if it's a problem. If it's moved to Schedule 2, a doctor could still prescribe up to a 90-day supply through a use of multiple prescriptions. And true, there's no oral, multiple, uh, oral prescription. You'll have to get a written prescription for Schedule II. Uh, we've put regulations in place so a doctor can issue multiple prescriptions up to a 90-day supply for that particular drug. So if they're worried about refills and going back to the doctor to get refills every month, it's just not the case. You don't have to do that. I think you just answered my next question about uh, regulatory analysis of the proposal. I suppose you have, because you said you, you went through the regulatory process. For Schedule twos, uh we wanted to ensure that a doctor could be able to prescribe a, a a multiple month supply to a patient. So we, when we went back in 2007, I believe, we changed the regulations so indeed a doctor could write multiple prescriptions. So if they're worried about putting multiple, if they're worried about a monthly supply, they could do a several month supply in a schedule two using the regulations that are in place right now. Does the administration have an official view on reclassified hydrocodone? The administration has not taken a position. As I said before, we sent the reclassification scientific and medical evaluation up to the FDA. We're waiting for their thoughts on it, their evaluation. Thank you. Thank you. I would be most interested in the response. Um, thank you, Senator Grassley. Senator Udall. Thank you, uh, Chairman. The, the uh, prescription drug abuse prevention plan created by the administration has four uh, major areas, education, uh, prescription drug, prescription drug monitoring programs in each state, proper medical disposal, and smart law enforcement. Uh, to what degree has this comprehensive approach been implemented nationally? And in your opinion, is this sufficient to address the crisis we're facing? Uh, I uh, have tried to articulate a little bit on each one of those pillars uh, uh, and where we've made progress. Uh, but I had also made it clear that, uh, that much more work uh, needed to be done. And so much of this is also because the, the states govern the practice of medicine and the states govern the practice of pharmacy, not the federal government. So it is a, it's, a, it's a real partnership collaborative effort. Every one of the states now, 49, that have a prescription drug monitoring program in place uh, have worked uh, to institute best practices. They also are working very hard just to find the money to keep those programs going, even though they truly are a patient uh, safety tool. The media campaign uh, that uh, is important for us because it helps to educate young people about the dangers of drugs, and young people are very naive about prescription drugs. 
uh, because they're not uh, sold from a piece of tin foil in the back of a, of a convenience store. Uh, they think that these things are safe, and so we need a much more robust and, and frankly, a more well-funded media campaign to help young people understand the dangers. But we have made progress in those areas, and so much of it depends on the partnership. We, we, um, we've heard from several witnesses that the DEA is using tactics to curb prescription drug abuse that are similar to how the agency works to curb illicit drug trafficking and use, shrinking the supply of, uh, of prescription drugs. Uh, can, can you uh, comment on, on uh, the DEA's efforts to collect unused prescription drugs and regulations preventing pharmacists from performing this task? You Let's sort of begin with uh, the Controlled Substances Act, as written, does not allow an ultimate user to hand off those drugs to anybody uh, except for a law enforcement official or he could dispose it of him by himself. Uh, the fact is the way the act is written, it's very narrow because they're considered exempt from registration. Only a registrant could hand the drugs to each other. Other than that, it's an 841A1 delivery, which is an illegal act. That's why we have law enforcement throughout the country, our partners working on these take back days to collect the drugs. Also law enforcement on their own are collecting drugs uh, outside of the take back days. Uh, it's not that we're preventing them, it's the statute is preventing them. Now with the Safe and Disposal, uh, a Secure and Responsible Disposal Act, we will be able to write regs to have authorized individuals within the community collect those medications that don't have to be law enforcement, and that's what we're working on now, and we should have something in place in the next several months. Representative Bono, Mac, could you uh, um, tell us what your perspective is from the, your task force that you serve on and, and uh, where you think uh, we should be headed hearing the testimony you just heard? Well, Senator, thank you very much for the question. It's good to see you again. It's great to see you again. Uh, first of all, I'd like to just say that this hearing is a great start. The late, great Betty Ford was a constituent of mine up until her passing, and she was one who always spoke about the need to speak openly about problems. And I think until now, we haven't done that. Um, in my opening statement, I asked that we convene some sort of a stakeholders roundtable discussion where we all come together and solve this problem, and there's something that you said, Senator, in your opening statement that really struck me, and I think it's an important point to drive home, that uh, for many of these families, and I know two of the people who sit behind me right now, their children didn't have an opportunity to go to rehab. The problem is so out of control that, that children are becoming addicted so quickly and dying so quickly that rehab's not an option. But those who are fortunate enough to go to rehab will be lifelong opiate addicts. For the rest of the life, their life, they will be predisposed towards uh, problems with opiates. They will be battling this disease for the rest of their life. And I think it's very important uh, that we recognize there's almost a dual track that we need to pursue. One is to stop the pills from getting in the hands of those who don't need them. And the other track, of course, to make sure that those who are trying to wrestle with the disease of addiction have the opportunities to uh, get the treatment that they need. And I know that the director has uh, done a lot in this area, and I, and I applaud him for his work on that. I'd like to thank the DEA. I think for a long time they were uh, not paying attention to this epidemic. And I think when you look at the chart that you have up there behind the dais, you recognize that the numbers are screaming upward. And I think, without my old lady glasses on, the, no, the latest uh, information up there is, what does it say, 09? I would speculate that the numbers are screaming up even higher. Uh, so again, I would think that we need to convene uh, bright minds all together and figure this out. And I can say as lawmakers, I can comfortably say to you all that if we attack this on a bipartisan basis, you know, we can save thousands of lives immediately. And if we don't do it, how many more lives are we going to lose in the process? So again, I thank you for this hearing. I think that the notion that we're talking about it in the nation's capital is a step in the, in the right direction. And I thank you all very much for your attention to it. Thank you, and we're, we're very glad that you're involved in this, and I think one of the things you hit on the head was demonstrated in a, in a recent New Mexico public broadcasting story where they talked to a father who shared uh, his son's uh, heroin overdose, and the father said, 
I, you know, I looked for the answers. I tried to figure out ways to help. What I kept hearing was you have to allow them to hit bottom, and some addicts die on the way to the bottom. Even on the, on the day he died, he was the one on the phone looking for treatment centers that could help him. And I think uh, all of us need to stay focused on that because I think many of these uh, young people uh, are searching for help, and, and uh, we have the opportunity, I think, to, to give them the help they need to get on a constructive course. Thank you, Thank you Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, we're joined by Senator Schumer. Uh, Senator Schumer, if you want to make a statement, go ahead. Uh, the time is five minutes. Uh, use it as you will. Thank you, and I want to thank you, Senator Feinstein and Senator Grassley, for having this hearing. Uh, it, it is so needed. Uh, as somebody like yourselves who's been long involved in the fight against drugs, I remember when crack began to raise its ugly head uh, in America. And frankly, society didn't do enough about it, and it got its tentacles in our society, and it took decades to help loosen those tentacles, which are still there. Well, the same thing is now happening with prescription drug abuse. And we're doing, we're, we're trying, as this hearing does, to not repeat the mistake, made the same mistake that those made when crack came about, which is too little, too late. Uh, I also want to thank you for inviting a Buffalo resident, uh, Avi Israel, to share his heartfelt story here today. Of course, I know Avi and the great loss he suffered. Uh, his son, Michael, um, died of a prescription drug overdose, and he'll tell you his heartfelt story. Avi's an amazing guy, and he is doing what the scriptures tell us to do um, when something horrible this happens, try to turn it Instead of just cursing the darkness, it's really almost saint-like to light a candle, by lighting a candle in this case. And I thank all of the families who are here, not only Avi, uh, trying to make sure what happened to his son doesn't happen to so many others. And he's been a great advocate and helped lead the charge for a law uh, that we have passed in New York uh, for a registry, and I'm hopeful we can pass the same kind of national law since Senator Rockefeller has a bill that I'm a sponsor of to do that. So let me ask a few questions here, and this is sort of a Buffalo hearing because Mr. Kurlikowski I first met when he was police chief of Buffalo. Yeah. So he's come, he's gone down since then, uh, but not by much. Um, not by much. So thank you all for being here. My first question is to uh, Mr. Ranazizi. Uh, I understand you've been a pharmacist who's handled controlled substances for 20 years, and a petition was filed 12 years ago to reschedule hydrocodone to become a Schedule II drug. Uh, we all know it's very similar to oxycodone, extremely high abuse potential, one of the most prescribed drugs in the United States. And last month, I co-sponsored an amendment to the FDA bill that would have rescheduled hydrocodone as a Schedule II drug. While we made some progress in that bill on bath salts and synthetic marijuana, the law there, with the help of some of the people at this table, Senator Grassley was a co-sponsor, as was Senator Portman, as was Senator Klobuchar, but this was taken out in the conference committee, unfortunately, because I think one senator objected. Rescheduling hydrocodone would require doctors to provide more oversight of those that are taking these pills and ensure that the drugs are kept secure. So I know there's no official position yet, but you, Mr. Ranazizi, as a pharmacist, as somebody who understands the problems here, um, do you personally believe the U.S. should reschedule hydrocodone to get a better handle on the prescription drug abuse crisis? As a pharmacist, I believe that Hydrocodone is equipotent or close to equipotency to many of the drugs, including oxycodone and Schedule II. And I believe it has the same abuse liability profile. And I think the literature shows that to some. So it, as a pharmacist, yeah, I, I would Good. think that it should be. Uh, Thank you. Well, we will, and I know you have to work through all the right channels and has to go up 28 steps, but I hope you'll work and we will work to see that this happens as uh, in the Justice Department, but I thank you for that answer. That's very helpful and very important that you said that. Um, I, to Director Krolikowski, uh, as you know, New York passed its drug prescription drug monitoring database, 
real-time monitoring of patients by both doctors and pharmacists, something that I have advocated for and Avi helped create, really, in New York. Um, while I understand that in the fiscal year uh, 13 budget request, the administration did not ask for any funding, and we're currently working on reauthorization. Will you commit to work with us to reauthorize and refund this important program? We're very committed to uh, uh, helping to see that that's done for the NASPER program. We're supportive of certainly the, the Hal Rogers uh, prescription drug monitoring program. And also, I think there are going to have to be some uh, uh, looks in the future at where the money is going to come to support these patient safety tools. Even though once they're up and running, they're not particularly expensive and they're not that difficult uh, to maintain. Uh, and with Dr. Edie here, we have the, the real expert in that area. But these hold great potential for making the changes that you have talked about, Senator. Thank you, uh, Mr. Karolikowski. Uh, do I have time for one more question? My clock yes, says 5 o'clock, so 5 oh, well, minutes, so I don't know. Yeah, because okay, thank you're you. late, we'll give you another minute. Oh. Then I'll have to make a habit of it. No. Uh, no. <laughs> she knows I do already. That was the inside joke. Um, the FDA just finalized its <laughs> rule for risk evaluation management system. This is to Mr. Krolikowski again, uh, for long-action opioids. However, this rule does not require mandatory doctor training nor any action on shorter-acting opioids like Vicodin. Now, uh, Senator Rockefeller has a bill, I'm a co-sponsor, that would require physician education, as, you, as I know you, that you strongly believe that doctors must receive education regarding these potential dangerous prescription pills. Uh, tell me this, while the FDA's REMS plan is a first step, what must be done to make the rules stronger so they actually have an effect? And do you think the FDA should investigate developing a REMS for the short-acting opioids that also have high abuse potential? I think it's going to be very important that we expand uh, uh, from voluntary to mandatory. Uh, in my many, many meetings with physician groups and others in the healthcare industry, they're very engaged in wanting to do this, but they're also very busy. And if it isn't mandatory, I'm, I'm just afraid that it's not going to get the level uh, of attention that it should and that it won't be speedy enough. So the other part is to expand it beyond certainly just the prescribing physicians, but others in the healthcare industry. And I think that's one of the important parts of, of really uh, the changes that are being done. And frankly, the pharmaceutical industry is going to have to step up to the plate uh, in a in a much more uh, strident manner, uh, including uh, uh, funding uh, in the future to make some of these systems work. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to release this panel, say thank you very much. Uh, we have a second panel, and uh, I would ask them to come forward at this time and be introduced, but thank you. You've added a great deal to it, and uh, I, for one, would like to see if Senator Grassley and ourselves can put together a package of legislation. Um, I probably tend to be more restrictive on the prescriptions, the, pr the ability of people to prescribe large amounts of this medication. So I'd like to, do, you know, talk about that a little bit more. I think there are real abuses in prescription. Thank you. Thank you. let alone selling it without pursuit. I am now pleased to welcome our second panel of witnesses. It will be the, the same uh, system. I'll introduce each one at their time, and if each speaker would confine their statements to five minutes, we'll have more time uh, for questions. Uh, I'd like to introduce John Eady. He's the director of the Prescription Monitoring Center of Excellence at Brandeis University. In this role, Mr. Eady oversees the center's work 
to combat prescription drug abuse. The center evaluates existing drug monitoring programs to identify best practices, something we're very interested in. It also provides information analysis and support to state and federal agencies operating prescription monitoring programs. Mr. Eady has over 40 years of experience in the public health field. He is also the co-founder of the Alliance of States with Prescription Monitoring Programs and directed New York's Division of Public Health Protection. So you're very welcome uh, here, Mr. Eady. We look forward to your comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Feinstein, Co-Chairman Grassley, Senator Udall, and Senator Schumer. Let's Schum fix your mic so it's not all static. I'm sorry. Get somebody to come down and help you. Try it again, and then if not... Thank you. Good afternoon. Is Good that better? Good afternoon. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm, I appreciate the opportunity to present to you issues uh, we're working on at the Prescription Monitoring Program Center of Excellence at Brandeis University. Um, and I thank you for your uh, review of the, um, the work of the, of the center. I would go on to comment that, that our base funding is provided from a grant uh, of the Bureau of Justice Assistance from <coughs> the Department of Justice using funds from the Harold Rogers Prescription Drug Monitoring Program grant. In addition, BJA, FDA, and the CDC provide a combined grant for the new prescription behavior surveillance system, which we are just now setting up. And, and, and also, the Pew Charitable Trusts have provided a grant to produce a white paper on prescription drug monitoring program best practices that will be, uh, a draft has been provided uh, to the committee, and it will be finally finalized in the next probably six weeks and, and released. Uh, to independently and objectively carry out our mission, the center does not accept funding directly or indirectly from drug manufacturers or, or others with a financial stake in the Good. sales of controlled substances. That policy is stated on our website. Our, our work is focused on helping PDMPs and other stakeholders to identify the important and most effective means possible to intervene in the prescription drug abuse epidemic. As a brief overview, prescription drug monitoring programs collect data from pharmacies regarding each controlled substance prescription, and that information is made available in, in aggregate to prescribers, pharmacies, law enforcement, health professional licensing agencies, and depending on the state, to Medicaid programs, medical examiners, drug courts, drug treatment programs, and others. 49 states now have statutorily authorized PDMPs. Some 42 are operational. And these programs have been, the majority of these programs have been authorized since 2003, when, which was the advent of the Harold Rogers Prescription Drug Monitoring Pro Grant Program. Mr. Eady, we have a very comprehensive statement of your process. If you could tell us what you find and what you recommend, Absolutely. that would be very helpful. Yes. I would like to point out that prescription monitoring programs are both public health and public safety. For analogy, can you imagine the major public health initiatives to reduce traffic accident injuries and fatalities without fully engaging law enforcement? How would public health agencies enforce speed limits and seatbelt laws without law enforcement? Good doctors and pharmacists cannot stop criminal doctor shopping rings or pill mills that, have, that sell prescriptions for cash. That's an important point for us to bear in mind, that, that we need a comprehensive approach involving all sectors of public service, both public health and public safety. Going forward, a new generation of PDMPs adopting best practices must be set forward with the focus on, respond, on the need for proactive confrontation of the epidemic and not just reactive response to others' requests. 
And we are, the white paper focuses on that, but let me just go through and highlight some of the key th recommendations for proactive reporting. First is unsolicited reports. At the present time, not all prescription monitoring programs are in fact providing reports to doctors and pharmacists, even when they identify possible doctor shoppers. That we recommend strongly that that change, that every state should proactively provide that information to all doctors who are involved and all pharmacists. Otherwise, they have no way of knowing that their patients are in fact engaged in doctor shopping. Likewise, they should also analyze the data and provide it to law enforcement and to the um, um, professional licensing agencies. Uh, in fact, on the latter regard, in 2011, only eight PMPs were providing the data to law enforcement and only seven to professional licensing agencies. Next thing is on requesting of reports. The, we need to increase prescriber and pharmacist use of prescription monitoring programs. The new initiative of New York, Tennessee, and Kentucky to require mandatory use of the prescription monitoring programs by physicians, I think is a very important initiative and other states should actively consider it. In fact, one of my recommendations is for you to consider that in relationship to Medicaid and Medicare. And I'll explain. Uh, in any event, they also there's work of the Office of National Coordinator for Health Information Technology, which is very important to make access seamless for prescribers and for pharmacists. And we fully support that and want that to continue. The, also, there is a need for, uh, the, for states that have unnecessary impediments to law enforcement accessing their data to remove those unnecessary hurdles and replace them with proper training of the law enforcement agencies and adequate supervision and accountability. Health professional licensing agencies need to increase their use of data. All pharmacies should be required to uh, positively identify who is picking up every prescription. In Massachusetts, they found 38% of the prescriptions were either delivered to the pharmacy or picked up from the pharmacy by persons who are not the patient. If we don't know who actually has got control of the pill bottle, we have no idea who really has, who actually has access to the drugs. There are other aspects that were in the GAO report of 2009 that also should be implemented in coordination between PMPs and pharmacies. We also need to increase the use of, uh, by others in uh, to the access of the prescription drug monitoring program data. This includes state Medicaid agencies. Right now, about half the states give access to prescription data to Medicaid agencies, and only one at the moment that I'm aware of provides data to a Medicare agency. And yet, Medicare and Medicaid are responsible for vast quantities of the prescriptions being uh, uh, used in this regard, and many may be also trying to limit access for people who may be avoiding it by buying with cash. Prescription monitoring programs are an important tool that both Medicaid and Medicare needs access to. Uh, the, we've, we've heard already about interstate prescription monitoring program. Data sharing interoperability is a critical issue. It needs to be completed using the prescription monitoring information exchange architecture, which BJA and others have developed over the last five or six years. And that process needs to be completed with all states. The prescription behavior surveillance system, I won't go into it in detail, we're just setting it up, but it, is, it, is, it involves de-identified data being submitted by multiple states to us at the center of excellence so we can actually run analysis of the data and provide it back. One of the most important aspects of that is we believe an early warning system. Our principal investigator has, using spatial analysis with Massachusetts data, been able to, number one, directly show a correlation geographically. Those areas with the highest doctor shopping rates are also those areas with the highest rates of overdoses and deaths. That gets to your question earlier about the use of uh, pill mills who trade in uh, dealing with doctor shoppers. And uh, specifically, there is a connection that, he is, that that data has shown uh, regarding overdoses and deaths and the uh, doctor shopping activity. More importantly, a uh, most recent effort has shown that the doctor shopping activity, which PMPs can show, is predictive of future increases. So if you find an area increasing today in doctor shopping activities, you can predict three or four years in advance that there will be increasing overdoses and deaths in those areas. The power of that is that for the first time we have a tool available that will allow communities and states 
to, to focus their resources on the most important areas where they can bring the educational community together, they can bring uh, law enforcement, they can bring physicians and pharmacists and the entire public health community together with prevention specialists on substance abuse to, to focus in on those areas and cut down on the, the over doctor shopping and the overuse of, and the deaths and uh, overdoses that would follow. I don't want to be like Judge Judy, but if you could conclude, we have. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, number one, recommendations. Uh, by the way, mandatory prescriber education has been discussed. I think it's absolutely essential. But for the caucus to consider, given the federal payments for both Medicare and Medicaid and the fact that prescriptions issued under both of those programs are involved in, and paid for, that lead to or are involved in the deaths and overdoses of, of enrollees in those programs, it would seem reasonable for the federal government to, to at least consider requiring or mandating that as a condition of payment that prescribers and pharmacies review p prescription drug monitoring pr program data prior to the issuance of the first controlled pros substance prescription, excuse me, and periodically thereafter, say every six months, when therapy is continued. Secondly, Shouldn't P prescription drug monitoring programs that receive federal funds be required to provide prescription monitoring program data to these healthcare systems? And the same thought, by the way, might apply to the Indian Health Service, Veterans Affairs, and to DOD eventually when they become part of this process. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm afraid I'm going to cut you off because we're limited in time and you've done 10 minutes. So thank you very much. Um, Mr. Avi Israel is a parent advocate. Um, Senator uh, Schumer uh, indicated what a prominent person he is in this movement and uh, that his story is a very difficult one. He is the founder of Save the Michaels of the World, an organization dedicated to curbing prescription drug abuse. He's from Buffalo, New York. You should introduce him, Chuck. Would you like to do that? You introduce him. In my opening remarks, did, did that. And just well, want to tell you, he's a beacon of strength um, and has done an amazing job in New York, and hopefully he can do the same job well, in the nation. Well, more importantly, his work has resulted in the passage of, the of a New York yes. law, which I gather mandates better coordination among health care providers and pharmacists to prevent prescription drugs. It has a registry so, for both doctors and pharmacists. Ah. It's regarded as the strongest in the country, and it wouldn't have happened without Avi. Good. All right. He'll tell us about it. Welcome, Mr. Israel. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Senator uh, Feinstein. Uh, you need the mic. If staff could move the mic, please. And, um, Senator Schumer, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Again, my name is Avi Israel, and I'm here to speak for my son, Michael David Israel. Michael was everybody's dream child, never got into trouble, was a very compassionate, sensitive young man. Michael took his life at the age of 20. On June 4th, 2011, my only boy put a shotgun under his chin and shot himself. Michael took his life because our healthcare system failed him and is failing countless of others every day. Michael <coughs> was struck with Crohn's disease at the age of 12 and fought it courageously for as long as he could. At the age of 18, Michael transitioned from pediatric to adult GI. And that, in my opinion, is when the caring stopped. Michael became another file, just another spoke in the wheel of chronic disease. Rather than find the source of Michael's pain, all three of his doctors supplied Michael with a plethora of drugs. Three different doctors who never spoke to each other, didn't communicate with each other regarding Michael's care. And the sad part is two of them are in the same practice. His surgeon prescribed hydrocodone. 
our family doctor prescribed Xanax, and his GI doctor prescribed Cymbalta and 18 other drugs for Crohn's disease. All these medication was prescribed to an 18-year-old kid who weighed at the time of his death 107 pounds. My wife Julie and I accompanied Michael to the doctors and not once, and I'm going to say it again, not once did any of them ever inform Michael, my wife, or me, the medication he was taking was highly addictive and had severe side effect. In December of 2010, Michael sat on my bed and said, Pops, I have problems with my pain pills. I think I'm addicted. I did not know the severity of the problem, and I replied, okay, Michael, we'll tell the doctor next week when we see him. The following week, I informed the surgeon of Michael's concern, got a pad on my shoulder with a comment that Michael needs his pills now. I was politely dismissed. In January 2011, Michael was admitted to a hospital. He needed an ileostomy surgery. At the time, Michael weighed 95 pounds. For the month of January and February, Michael was being fed highly addictive painkillers like morphine and Dilaudid. Again, we brought up the issue of addiction with his doctor, and the doctor said Michael will be weaned off before he leaves the hospital. At the end of February, Michael left the hospital with an ileostomy bag and a prescription for hydrocodone with three refills on it. Each refill was 240 pills. During Easter week of 2011, Michael asked to enter a detox center. We called our insurance company and were given names of three facilities. After making phone calls for a week, we finally got him admitted to an adult facility. This is one of the biggest failure in the healthcare system. In case you don't know, there's a severe shortage in this country for a rehab facility for young adults ages 18 to 25. So Michael had to spend five days in detox facility with people who roamed the street and drugs was a way of living for them. There's a kid who came out of private schools who was studying architecture at the University of Buffalo only weighed 95 pounds with an ileostomy bag, spending five days in a detox center, which scared the hell out of him. On May 15, Michael tried to commit suicide. He sent me a text which said, you do not deserve a son like me, I love you. He locked himself in the garage with the motor running. Luckily, I got a hold of Julie, my wife. She called him and was able to talk him out of it while I raced home frantically calling 911. When I got there, Michael was out of the garage talking to a police officer. Michael was transported to our county hospital, and there's another failure in our system. Michael was released after eight hours he really should have been in there, he should have been held in there for 72 hours for observation. On June 4th, <coughs> Michael asked his opiate counselor for help to be admitted to a facility. He was getting tired of fighting the craving. After five minutes and 47 seconds, the counselor called back and told Michael there are no beds available for him. Michael handed me the phone I asked a young lady, what should we do? Her reply was, wait until Monday or take him to the county hospital. In the meantime, Michael walked to the back of the house, pulled an old shotgun, and locked himself in my bedroom. We tried to open the door. We tried to call Michael out. I heard the gun being cocked and a second later, a shot followed. I kicked the door open and noticed blood all over the walls and the ceiling. 
I asked my wife to call 911. I knelt next to my son, and he was struggling to breathe. His body was shaken. Blood was pouring out of his neck. I knew that my son was not going to make it. I kissed his head, rubbed his hand. As I said, I love you, Michael, he took his last breath. These images that I relieve every night when I try to go to sleep. I put the blame for my son's death and thousands of other people who take their life or overdose squarely on the shoulders of a flawed healthcare system, which includes doctors, insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, and the FDA for a failure to do its job. In this flawed healthcare system, our insurance costs are the highest in the world. We get the least amount of services for our, from, for our money. And out of 40 industrial countries, we rank number 37. This is a healthcare system which insurance company dictate what services you can and cannot receive. Our insurance company only paid for three days in detox center for, and refused to pay the rest because they could not receive report about Michael from the facility, which according to the HIPAA laws, they're not allowed to disclose any information. This system, which only allows a doctor to spend 15 minutes with you because that's all they can bill for, 15 minutes per patient. You need to wrap it up, okay. I'm sorry. In this healthcare system, doctors, physician assistant, and nurses practitioner can write prescription for highly addictive narcotics without any formal training in pain management, nor any training in addiction. And the worst part, they do not inform you of the consequences of, of, of medication. The United States has 4.6% of the world population has consumed 99.8% of hydrocodone produced in the world. I'm not a healthcare expert. However, you don't have to be a healthcare expert to see deficiency in our system. I would recommend that a real-time prescription monitoring system like the iStop system in New York State be implemented across this country, including electronic medical record system that connects all 50 states and every medical provider. We need mandatory continuing education for all prescribers tied to their DEA license renewal on the danger of opiate. Opiate should only be prescribed for severe pain, but it has proven that other non-addictive analgesic and treatment program are not effective for treating that pain. Why we believe it's fair that the pharmaceutical companies are responsible to pay for such education, they must not influence said education. Mr. Israel, could you conclude, please? Yeah. We must institute electronic prescription rather than paper prescription for narcotic. This will create more control over the, over pr the products. All pharmacies must mandate to report in real time drug dispensing and communication in real time with other pharmacies. The FDA is a watchdog agency has failed in its responsibility to the citizens of this country. This agency should be free of influence from pharmaceuticals or any other interest group. Until that happens, we are going to keep losing people in this country due to the negligence of the FDA. <clears throat> These are simple recommendations that should not offend anybody. However, we must always hold people above profits not the other way around. Until we do that, we're going to lose more Michaels every day. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, I regret having to cut you off. That's okay. We're gonna have to end uh, in not, not too long. Uh, I, I'd just like to relay the deep condolences of our committee to you and to your wife. And uh, I think we all listened very carefully to what you had to say. So thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, Vernon Porter is a parent advocate on the dangers of prescription drug abuse from Orange County, California. He is the founder of Recovered for Life, a nonprofit organization dedicated to preventing harm and loss of life 
from prescription drug addiction and overdoses. He's been an effective advocate at both the state and federal level and was featured in the recent documentary Behind the Orange Curtain, which spotlighted prescription drug abuse in Orange County. Mr. Porter is also an accomplished musician with 15 years experience in musical ministries. So I thank you for being here and we look forward to your comments. Ma'am, thank you for inviting us here this afternoon. We appreciate the opportunity to share our story. My name is Vernon Porter. On June 17, 2010, my daughter Vanessa Coriel Porter passed away from an accidental overdose. The drug was Opana. It was just four days past her 22nd birthday. Vanessa was a beautiful and vibrant young woman who had a lasting and powerful impact on many lives. Vanessa was student of the month so many times in elementary school it was hard to keep up with her awards. She completed high school a semester early with a 3.8 GPA and finished her first semester at Saddleback College with the same high marks. Vanessa was a gifted musician and vocalist as well, studying violin and piano from the age of eight years old. On the night Vanessa lost her life, I was at a late staff meeting arriving home at midnight. Vanessa was staying with us for two weeks, waiting for her new place to become available. When I saw that she wasn't home, I became concerned. I called her cell, and it went to voicemail, and after waiting a few minutes, called her again. I repeated this for an hour, and at 1 a.m., her phone was shut off. I called all night, and the next day, this was not like my daughter. Around 3.30 the next afternoon, I received a call from one of Vanessa's friends, screaming into my phone, saying, say it's not true, tell me she's not dead. There are no words to explain the emotions that overwhelm you after receiving a call like that. I immediately called the coroner and was told, this can't be your daughter. She's from the city of Lake Forest. We live in Laguna Nigel. My hopes were raised. I asked for her middle name. It's Coriel, and I knew it was my daughter. We found out through our own efforts that Vanessa was picked up at her work by two young ladies that she had not known for very long. They went to a man's apartment named Joe Black. Mr. Black was on probation for doctor shopping and prescription drug sales. Mr. Black provided alcohol and the drug Opana. If you're not familiar with the drug, Dr. Contaxis, head of the emergency department at the Eisenhower Medical Center, stated, it's like taking an atom bomb to a knife fight. Dr. Contaxis and many other doctors don't believe it should be in the marketplace. It was banned in this country for a decade. If you remove the time-release coating and consume it with alcohol, it is almost no, always fatal. Find out more. The two young women left Vanessa unconscious at Mr. Black's, and he called one of them at midnight and said that Vanessa was having a hard time breathing. The young lady told him to call 911. It was Mr. Black who shut off Vanessa's cell phone at 1 a.m. Because of Mr. Black's legal situation and fearing for his future, he did nothing. Vanessa passed at 4 a.m. on June 17th. Had the call to 911 been placed at midnight, she more than likely would have survived. Mr. Black waited for more than 12 hours to call 911. The coroner's office told us that Mr. Black would more than likely be charged in my daughter's death, but to our amazement, was not. When I asked his probation officer to hold him accountable and revoke his probation, he refused, stating that he needed to be concerned with Mr. Black's emotional well-being. Mr. Black had a long history of doctor shopping and illegal prescription drug sales. We believe that the system failed in regards to Mr. Black. Doctor shopping is such a huge problem in Orange County that a few days ago before my wife and I left Orange County to come out here, an attorney friend of mine shared with me that he was representing a young woman who had <coughs> 140 prescriptions for pain meds. Since Vanessa passed, we have been fighting for the Good Samaritan Law in California. In the states that have this law, the statistics bear out that it saves lives and does not increase risky behavior. And I would like to publicly thank Director Karolikowski for his help in connecting with me with folks who have uh, turned the corner on this in California. The Sheriff's Association has removed their opposition to this bill. We are very hopeful to get it signed into law very soon. The damage done to families after such a meaningless and tragic loss of a loved one are far-reaching. I come in contact with so many whose lives are changed forever. High divorce rates for parents who have lost a child, grandparents and siblings in therapy trying to find a new set of coping skills. Some never recover and stay disconnected for the rest of their lives. A friend of mine who is a grief care specialist told me within days of losing Vanessa that it would be two to five years before I started to come out of my grief. He was absolutely correct. Trying to force your lungs to breathe in the first year is an accomplishment in and of itself. Asking yourself the question that will never be answered in this life, why? 
The reason why I bring this up is to let you know how far-reaching the consequences are and the unbelievable cost to our country. With a prescription drug overdose occurring every 19 minutes in this country, how long will it be before it touches your family? With the destruction of our families, how long can we survive as a nation? This is not hyperbole. We have a major epidemic. We believe that an easy-to-implement plan of educating pharmacists on non-conforming prescription drug sales is an effective way to slow and pinch the supply chain. This was modeled by our family pharmacists who stopped filling them. We have a list of red flags that we share, and there's a group of high school students from our uh, area in Orange County that every weekend go out to pharmacies and uh, offer pharmacists their red flag list so they can educate them because they tell them their friends are dying. These young people are heroes. Orange County is the second in the nation in accidental overdose deaths. Mandatory, not voluntary, prescriber education for physicians on addiction and appropriate dosage, dosages of opioids before they get their DEA license. Voluntary programs do not work. And just look at the California Cures program if you want evidence of that. Now that is defunded and on its way out the door. The National Association of Pharmacy Boards PMP Interconnect program has a 7.5 second average uh, time for consol uh, consolidated multi-state PMP reports, which is an amazing uh, program, but if it's not used, it really, it's not very effective, obviously. The Hal Rogers Drug Monitoring Program, the reclassification of hydrocodone, many of the things that have been talked about here this afternoon, we fully agree with, but once again, if they're not implemented, it does no good. Big Pharma lobbying is out of control. Indo is lobbying Congress to allow psychologists to write for opiates, Opana specifically. Why would a, psychi a psychologist need the ability to write for pain meds? The answer is they don't. It's about profits. Psychologists that I speak with about this are not in favor of its passing. With medical studies proving brain damage caused in young developing minds by marijuana, stimulants, depressants, nicotine, alcohol, and opiates, are we really considering allowing six-year-old children to be used as lab rats for, by Purdue Pharma by prescribing Oxycontin? Have we lost our collective minds? Will the FDA approve this? This is a huge problem with many layers, but we must implement changes sooner than later. In the two years since Vanessa has passed, 72,000 people have died from an accidental overdose. Many of the laws that will be implemented are years away. How many more will die needlessly? How many more shattered families? If someone dropped a bomb on a city of 36,000 Americans a year, how quickly would we respond then? As citizens, we need to ask our medical profession to remember their Hippocratic Oath. If your doctor informed you that he or she was prescribing synthetic heroin for your pain and you could become addicted, would you still allow them to prescribe it? Vanessa's short life has had a far-reaching impact with the documentary behind the orange curtain sharing her story has been a call to action. There's a faith-based comedy club in Anaheim named for her as a testament to her great sense of humor. At the church she attended in San Juan Capistrano, they are starting Vanessa's Fund to help scholarship people who can't afford it into detox and recovery. There are at least a million things I would rather be doing with Vanessa today. <clears throat> Other than sharing our story with you. That's all right. Take that is our time. path. Take your time. Thank you. It is my hope that you, are, you who are sworn to protect the citizens of this country don't view our story as just a na another sad, tragic tale. That you will change the things you have the power to change now and tackle the difficult things with an unwavering commitment. There are thousands of families just like ours, and we want to help stop the phone call that no one wants to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Porter. That's ringing testimony and very much appreciated. Thank you. And please accept our deep condolence. Thank you. And we will try to respond, so thank you. Thank you. We appreciate that. Uh, last but not least, uh, Joseph Harmison is a pharmacist and owner of Harmison Pharmacies in Arlington, Texas. He's also a former president of the National Community Pharmacists Association. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Thank you for the opportunity. You want to turn on your mic? Oh. Nobody said a new technology. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Senator, for the opportunity to be here and to share community pharmacies' thoughts about the epidemic of drug abuse and misuse that we have in this country today. First, as a father and a grandfather, 
Let me express to y'all, I can only have nightmares of what you've gone through. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Farms has taken oath to try to aid people that are ill or in pain. We try to do that, and no one knows better than pharmacists what misuse or abuse of drugs can do. Unfortunately, we see it too often. But we also must keep in mind that there are people that have sometimes crippling pain that we have to not impede unnecessarily their ability to get the therapy that their physician decides they need. Pain is a significant problem in our society today, and it's going to get worse as our society ages. And the fact that nearly 70% of the medicines, the drugs that abusers use come from the family medicine cabinet and friends serves as a vital reminder that we need to curb abuse by assuring, <coughs> excuse me, proper quantities are initially prescribed to the drugs and that the proper disposal of the unwanted, unused, unneeded drugs is available to the public. Every day, pharmacies in this country are drop-off points for drug take-back. Unfortunately, as stated earlier, we do not have the ability to take back controlled substances, which is really what we're most concerned about. As stated earlier, the only person that can take back a controlled substance is a certified peace officer. The DEA has told me on a couple of occasions that they are promulgating rules that will allow the pharmacists that they trust to purchase, stock, dispense, advise people on the correct way to take it, to take these back and see that they are appropriately destroyed. We anxiously await those rules. Especially independent community pharmacists rely on long-term knowledge and face-to-face -face relationships with our patients. Most of the time, knowing the prescribers in our area to help us detect fraudulent prescriptions and doctor shoppers. If I have one of these prescriptions that I feel is funky, I will ask for some kind of what I believe to be valid identification. I will do my best to contact the physician to determine that this was really prescribed and this is what they wanted to have. Sometimes this is extremely difficult, especially in a large metropolitan area such as I'm in. These seem to coincidentally happen in evenings, weekends, holidays, and the prescriptions are most used commonly from emergency rooms. And if these are large medical practices or something like a large hospital like Parkland, if I try to contact a prescriber in Parkland, I've probably got a better chance of calling the White House and speaking directly to President Obama. It just is almost impossible to do. The prescription drug monitoring programs, I believe, are a potentially invaluable tool but they really are only of significant value to the practicing pharmacist if it is in real time and it can be incorporated into our pharmacy workflow computers. In Texas, as an offsite, we've been submitting this information to the state for probably at least 10 years. I do not have access to pull out that information to this day. I don't know what information is there. But if I have to wait and go to another computer system, as some states do, log on to the internet, hope everything works, there can be times past that patients sitting there, and time is very, very important here. We need this to happen. It needs to be real time. If insurance companies can tell me within a matter of seconds when I submit a claim to them, if this patient has gotten this medicine at some other pharmacy, within a certain time period. I don't know why a PMP cannot do that, but I don't speak technology well. I'll leave that to people that do. If 70% come from the medicine cabinet friends, the other 30%, or at least a significant part of that, come from pharmacy robberies and burglaries. Unfortunately, I have way too much firsthand experience with that. With my pharmacies, we've had robbery, uh, burglaries more than a dozen times over the years. Lately, 
from December 1st to January 15th of this year, we had three forced entries. Two of those turned out to be burglaries because they stole controlled substances. The third time, we apparently had put in enough very expensive security that they determined it was too much trouble and left by just doing property damage. The help I would seek from you is we can afford to put these in. It would be nice if we could change tax laws to an item that maybe cost $4,000. Be nice to depreciate that in the year it was purchased instead of over seven years. Those things would be helpful. Not necessary, but helpful. Also, if you can do something as well as you can mandate federal, state, and local enforcement and regulatory agencies to talk to one another and cooperate so the left hand knows what the right hand is doing would be most beneficial. And for pity's sakes, close down the pill mills. Take the bad actors out of the system. There is a price to pay when you do wrong things. I want to assure this caucus that the pharmacists of today are ready, willing, and able to be participants in curing this problem. It can't, we can't do it alone. Everyone must be involved. The pharmacist, the prescriber, the patient, the pharmacy benefit manager, the wholesalers, the manufacturers, law enforcement, judiciary, and regulators all have a part to play, and they must do their part. We can do it. We need the tools. Help us get the tools. <coughs> I will commit the community independent pharmacists to working with Congress and local law enforcement and regulators to do this. We thank you for the time to be here, and we appreciate it. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Harmison. Unless he's hidden and he's not, uh, I'm the only one here. Uh, so I, I would like to ask everybody one question, and then I'd like to kind of sum this up briefly, uh, as I see it anyway. Uh, but before I do, uh, Mr. Harmison, Senator Grassley asked me if I would ask you a question sure. on his behalf, and I will read it just as he said it. Uh, I have asked the DA, DEA about the impact of reclassifying hydrocodone uh, will have on the access for legitimate users of this drug. I'd like to get the perspective of someone who would be impacted if this drug became a Schedule II narcotic. Do you see a big impact? Yes, ma'am, Senator, I do. What do you see? I think it would be deleterious to the most legitimate patients. I don't think by reclassifying it to Schedule II that it is really going to cut down on the amount that is prescribed legitimately. I think it does give regulators and law enforcement a tool to monitor, but monitoring doesn't stop the abuse and misuse. It, it, there is a problem, and pharmacists I know talk to the patients about this. We tell them what it is. Yes, if you use it correctly, it is a wonderful tool. It can make your life better. You can pick up your children or grandchildren. You can hold down a job. If you abuse it, it can kill you. But used as you were instructed, this is something that's useful to you, and I just do not, over this 40-some-odd years I've done this, think that reclassifying it will make a substantive difference. Okay. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask each one of you... Um, out of all of this, I mean, there's education, there's prevention, uh, there's closing down the pill mills, uh, there's making hydrocodone uh, Schedule II, uh, there's um, l providing that none of these drugs can be sold without a physician's prescription, uh, there's a possibility of limiting the number of pills that could be sold. Some of this, you know, will be offensive to some people and supported by others. But let me ask you a question. What would you see, each one of you, as the single most important thing that could be done? As I see it, the only real advance that we see is what has happened in Florida. 
So I, I would, if you have an answer, I would really appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Eady? What is the number one legislative change that you would make that you believe could have the greatest impact? Uh, I believe that the, the effective use of prescription monitoring programs allows for the continued proper use of these drugs, but at the same time empowers all of the different parties that use the data to uh, limit its use to the right purposes. And so I think that uh, the uh, recommendation I made to you earlier uh, could be, in fact, as leading from Medicaid and Medicare standpoint, it could lead to ultimately to the ultimate use of this data by all prescribers and by all pharmacists prior to prescribing so that we cut off the problem at the beginning and uh, we limit its use. It's not a perfect solution. It's not the only solution. I think the other best practices that we, that we described and, and that will be coming are also going to make those systems even more effective than they have been, much more effective. I, I think it's the one real hope for protecting the legitimate use of these drugs while at the same time clamping down on the misuse. Thank you. Mr. Israel? Um, <clears throat> I'm going to add to that um, education, education of the public, and most of all, education of doctors and all prescribers. If we have the public, if, we, if, if the public know exactly what they're getting, if somebody came up to us when Michael was getting the medication and said, uh, Michael, Mr. Israel, uh, what I'm giving you is a, is a pill that's going to reduce Michael's pain. However, it's synthetic heroin. And if I think 99.9% .9 of people would say, uh, give me something else. If doctors and all prescribers were educated on the danger of opiates, I don't think they'll prescribe it as much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Porter? Yes, Senator. Uh, as we all know here, it's such a multi-layered issue and problem. Um, as we walk this thing out in the streets of Orange County and try to get a grip on it, uh, the thing that we see as being most effective is pinching the supply line. We're so focused on the end result so many times that we forget to look where it's coming from. And I believe that is with a real-time mon mandatory monitoring system. And in the meantime, educating pharmacists from the head of pharmaceutical or the pharmacy boards on down to each state to alert them and educate them on what a non-conforming prescription is. Most pharmacists don't know that I speak with. So if you can effectively pinch that supply line there, you're gonna start saving lives in a day. And that's something that does not require legislation that is fast moving. Yeah. It's simply an edict coming down from the pharmacy board down to the pharmacist. That's what we see. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Mr. Harmison? I agree that there are a lot of layers to that onion and one, no one thing will do it. But if I had to say one thing is enforce the laws, rules, and regulations that exist. If you're going to do the crime, be prepared to do the time. Thank you. On that note, um, it's very clear that we have a big problem. And uh, on both sides of the aisle here, we have very good staff. And I would like to ask that they work together. I have cleared this with Senator Grassley before he left and try to come up with a set of actions that we could have an opportunity to pass um, that would add to what we've heard here today as well as some of what we've heard here today. Um, I think with the... Um, administration doing some media on this, and if we have the laws right, if we really are able to close the pill mills, if we really are able to enforce uh, what is a conforming and a non-conforming prescription. I also happen to wonder why anyone would prescribe a hundred of these pills at any one time. Any doctor, it seemed to me you'd want to see your patient. You'd say, come back in a month, and we'll see how you're doing, and decide 
you know, whether we should continue this program or do something else. And so it seems to me that if you're going to prescribe these medications, because we now know what's happening with them, we now know that they fall into all kinds of hands, that they are misused, um, it seems to me that we have an obligation to see that they're not large in numbers floating around there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's something that I'd like to at least explore. Um, I'm not one for, you know, the wholesale prescription of drugs, all of which do good but also do damage. So we will put our, our thinking caps on We'd be very happy to hear from you or any of our audience. Uh, we've had, I think, the largest audience today of any drug caucus uh, hearing, which indicates to me the interest in this area. So if you all have thoughts and would like to get back to us, uh, please be constructive, because it's clear we have a big problem. And we have two people here who have just gone through it deeply and personally. So we need the help, we ask you for it, and I thank you very much for your testimony. The hearing is adjourned. Thank you, thank Senator. You.